Astronomers from around the world are expressing excitement about a radio signal coming from deep space. New Scientist magazine reports some say it might be a signal from an alien civilization. The signal coming from a point between the Pisces and Aries constellations has been detected three times by the SETI radio telescope in Puerto Rico. The giant antenna uses a worldwide network of personal computers to sift radio signals from space. Sounds like a movie. It does. <laughs> Contact, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, exactly. Bill, Bay Area scientists today said we need to decide what we're going to say to extraterrestrials. A recent discovery of a mystery signal, along with new technology, are leading some to predict we'll soon have a chance for a cosmic conversation. It's really startling when you think about it. KTVU Health and Science Editor John Fowler is here now with more. John? Startling it is, and it could be humanity's most important message, a simple hello. Across the globe, radio receivers like these are listening for a signal of intelligent life in the universe. And as in the movie Contact, real astronomers today say they have at least one mystery signal picked up by this dish in Puerto Rico last month. And they're confident technical advances will turn up a sign of E.T. We probably won't be able to decode it. We'll know they're out there, there's something out there, but we won't know much about their civilization. To come here and, uh, you know, molest us. According to the famous Drake equation, astronomers estimate there are some 10,000 intelligent civilizations just in our galaxy. The nearest one is likely very far away. But many scientists urge caution when it comes to initiating contact. They say it might be foolish, even dangerous for Earth, to assume we know all the risks. I don't think Earthlings should transmit messages right now. We're an emerging civilization. We're just getting in the game. Wertheimer heads the SETI at Home project at UC Berkeley. He says listening is one thing, replying quite another. We're just learning how to do this, and we really don't know what we're up to, and so we need to be careful. But in 2001, suddenly the media paid some interest, because then something appeared that was almost impossible to overlook. Right behind me is Britain's largest radio telescope, the Chilbolton Observatory. And here it was that the greatest sensation in the crop circle history was to appear in the fields right in front of the telescope. On the morning of 14th of August 2001, a formation was discovered which was different from any other previously seen. From the ground it looked like a tangled mess, wisps of crops spread around in no system. However, in the evening with growing shadows, a picture appeared, unmistakably that of a face. That picture represented a whole new technique, a screen technique, the same that's used for printing a picture on paper. Three days later, the face was joined by something that looked like a data strip. Rows of counters made out of standing and flattened crop. But soon, an astonishing similarity is discovered. In 1974, the astronomer Carl Sagan composed a message that NASA sent into space from the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico. Binary figures, which constituted a graphic code, presenting key factors about humans and the planet we live on. 27 years later, an identical pattern appears in a crop field right in front of a similar radio telescope. However, on closer inspection, it seemed to show that the code contained some fundamental differences. Sagan's message explained our calculation system, the dominant chemical substances within the elements that create life on Earth, about our DNA code, human's height and quantity, and that we live on the third planet in our solar system. And lastly, a sketch of our radio telescope. The message received described the same calculation system, but that silicon is most dominant in life forms in contrast to carbon. The drawing also clearly shows a humanoid figure with large head in relation to its body. 
It's also explained that they have an extra string in their DNA, are approximately four feet tall, inhabit the third, fourth and fifth planets in their solar system and have a population of around 21.3 billion. Underneath, the telescope has been replaced by something more complex. One year earlier, a strange crop circle had appeared in the same place. Is this the same illustration as in the sender's code? Is this the correspondence radio telescope? If this is not an extremely clever and well-calculated joke conducted by humans, is it a serious response from an alien civilization? The Chill Bolton crop formations really gave new life to the speculations of who is behind this. Is it aliens? Where do they come from? And what is their purpose of this type of communication? The following year, very nearly on the same day, a new picture appears that gives new force to the alien theory, this time in Crabwood, near the town of Winchester in Hampshire. Once again we see a face, but this time there is an unmistakable resemblance to something extraterrestrial. The picture also contains a print, somewhat similar to that of a CD, with something that appears to be a coded message. This formation also has a new type of design, this time with horizontal line patterns of variable thickness, similar to that of a TV picture. The message on the disc is similar to a spiral band built up of many boxes. But data expert Paul Weigay manages to decipher the message. And I had to enlarge the, the disc quite substantially on the computer and run some image analysis over it to make it clear so that I could see what was a standing tuft and what was flattened. And while I was doing this, I noticed that every so often um, there was almost a mistake in the diagram. It was, it was like there was a tuft, the weather little square of tuft. It had done sort of half size. I thought well, that's a bit odd, was, and, it, and it seemed fairly regular. I was going round, and I sort of counted up, and it, it was sort of literally every sort of eight bytes or whatever. And I thought, oh, eight bytes, and yeah, you know, from computer side, um, is obviously some sort of binary code. Um, so then I you know, did the straightforward thing, I just converted it into ASCII, uh, which is the standard sort of com you know, uh, computer language that you, you encode the alphabet in. Um, and of course I then started to get words forming out, and I thought, oh, you know, I'm getting somewhere here. So I then did the whole thing for the whole lot um, and, and got this message. The message is in English and reads as follows. Beware the bearers of false gifts and their broken promises. Much pain, but still time. There is good out there. We oppose deception. Conduit closing. Many have been surprised by this message. Are there aliens with such faces that we should be aware of? Or is this a picture of the sender? Does this indicate the start of actual close contact with neighbors in the universe? My own, and this is only a hypothesis, belief about this, is that um, there's an effort of the e extraterrestrials are gradually trying to communicate with us, uh, a very slow process, giving us a lot of time to digest the fact that we may not be alone here. Here we have an amateur astronomer capable of catching these things with his small telescope and a small camcorder. As it always goes with discoverers of great things, he has no funding, no high-end telescopes, no high-end cameras. He has found something that through his apparatus that he invented is capable of capturing interstellar spacecraft
If the starships that John Leonard Walson has captured in deep space are ours, then I am glad we have them out there protecting our planet. What they are protecting us from is thought-provoking, to say the least. These things are enormous. On the other hand, if they are not ours, I wonder who or what is operating them. There was a fear then that, uh, of something out there. It became a very big concern. Asteroids, UFOs, people coming from other places. Paranoia was also there within the government. You know, at certain levels, you could feel it. You knew it was happening. I noticed the satellite's positionings. I said, now this is supposed to be a system that tracks radar anomalies on Earth, right? You know, the whole thing, the movement. Yep, that's what it does. And I said, well, why are half of them pointed towards the outer space? Towards the moon, towards areas that are just blank space? Well, I don't know. It was a reply. He says, never thought about it. He says, well, at least half of those satellites you got up there aren't looking at Earth. <laughs> I said, what are they looking for? He says, well, you got to have need to know, know about that. I said, I see. In other words, who's coming? <laughs> he says, we don't know. About the end of subject. Ever since I got involved with John Leonard Wilson, I always now look at the Big Dipper in a totally different way. I can't wait to have people all over the world seeing them. The great thing about the interstellar starships is we know where they are. One of the scientists said, it's the Star Wars project. Okay, if that's the case, where were we when they put these things up there? When one thinks how much one large structure weighs, it's inconceivable how we got it into deep space. The machinery it would take to construct one of these things is no less conceivable. And the fact that they can expand and transform into different shapes in deep space is extraordinary. There are questions I have. If they are man-made, then we must have technologies that are way beyond our comprehension. What kind of energy systems are being applied here? This is one big puzzle that has yet to be solved, or at the very least, acknowledged. As John Leonard Walson follows them with his telescope, they are in perfect sync with the Earth's orbit. Posing as a star in Orion's belt, the Big Dipper, Vega, or in other constellations. This means that perhaps if one structure is 2.5 light years away, it may be orbiting around Earth at millions of miles per hour. With those kinds of velocities, and with the capability of being able to effortlessly change and transform, it takes an enormous amount of energy. What kind of alloys are they made of that allows them to transform and retract at these velocities in deep space?
It has taken us at least 10 years for the United States, with the help of Russia and other countries, to construct the space station. And when you look at these huge structures that are in deep space, you just have to wonder, what are these things? Who inhabits them? There are rumors about secret projects where men and women have been sent into outer space as an exchange program. You need to think about this. We have wars going on right now here on Earth. Our planet is in turmoil. People of the Earth have no concept as to what reality is anymore. We are too busy fighting terrorists, too busy looking out for human enemies. Is something more sinister awaiting our planet? Are we under observation and under close scrutiny? We don't know what we are about to learn about the interstellar communities that are obviously among us, orbiting our planet in our immediate solar system. For the moment, we have barely tipped the iceberg. Here we have an even more, more amazing piece and you know you, you are all some of the first ones to see these. And um, you, you can see again we have a solar system, um, here is a planet with an atmosphere. There is a ship here and a ship here and uh, there is a nice little blow up of what's inside the dome of the ship in case you're confused about what it is and uh, this is as well you know you can see the steps here typical of um, you know pyramidal uh, step pyramids and here we can see that this ship is following a comet that is coming at the earth or at least at the planet that's here and you can see that this UFO right uh, which you can see is moving at high velocity is doing something to uh, push the comet. So this could be a representation of an event uh, either in our past or in our future. So if um, here you have um, it, you know you shouldn't be recording this. No recording. Okay, so here we have other pieces. Again, okay, we have a solar system. The sun is very clear here. We have a planet with an atmosphere. We have another planet here. And we've got an ascending um, ship here. Another one down there. And then one inside the sun flare. So here, oh, uh, sorry. So here we see a UFO coming out of the sun. Uh, it's very specific.
They're called crop circles, huge geometrically perfect shapes that literally appear overnight carved right out of farmers' fields. Some believe they're UFO landing pads. Others think they might be some sort of cosmic road sign. And, of course, many people just think they are hoaxes. Recently, the story of these crop circles took a dramatic turn. For the first time, physical evidence of their creation may have been discovered. At first glance, they look like ancient Roman dinnerware, but some believe they are something far more dramatic, extraterrestrial artifacts left behind by the crop circle's mysterious creators. The plate is like a map, the map of um, the uh, crop circles. You know, the, the same signs you see on the, you saw on the fields, you saw on the plate. These are ancient, sacred symbols, and in my opinion, the phenomenon appears to reawaken our hidden memories of these ancient symbols of communication to tell mankind that we are really entering a new age, the age when the gods return. All indications are that uh, this is part of a pattern of powerful, unusual intelligence showing itself on the planet. Is an alien power drawing messages on a canvas of grain? Are these circles an elaborate global hoax? Our story of the latest development in this mystery begins on the morning of July 20th, 1991, when jogger Hans Slan discovered these patterns carved into the wheat fields of Grasdorf, Germany. 150 feet long and 50 feet wide, they were inscribed with ancient symbols that appear to be in the lost Celtic language. This is a message. This is indeed a message by a non-human intelligence. After receiving a telephone tip, local journalist Claudia Brebach was one of the first investigators to arrive on the scene. She immediately ordered a series of aerial photographs for analysis. They were just huge. They were really amazing because they were so huge. And I first thought it couldn't be human being doing this. If it's a human being having done this, it's a genius, really. Because it's, I, I think it was about 100 meters long and the circles were, were exactly made and it was really beautiful. Our investigative team invited German researcher and author Michael Hesseman to analyze the origins of the grass door circles. He began with a land survey to determine if the circles could possibly be a hoax. If you fake them, you would really align them with the tram lines. But they are not in alignment to the tram lines. And it is exactly in an east-west alignment. And so really guide me to the conclusion that we have a real phenomenon and that they are not made by human beings. Analysis of soil and plant samples taken from the grass dwarf circles revealed some unusual characteristics. The stalks are bent but not broken. They lay down one by, by the next one, one next to each other in a circular pattern. We found molecular changes, we found genetic changes, we found all indications of a great heat. Scientific tests performed by the Technical University in Berlin showed radiation levels inside the crop circles that were 172% higher than in the field around it. In April, psychic Helga Lundström visited another section of the Grasdorf fields where the unexplained phenomena had been captured on film. This is amazing. She really detected the uh, right side of what we call the sun wheel, and what is one of the uh, um, circles we had in the pictogram. And it is really amazing how she, after you know two and a half years, really detected the right side for this formation. The mystery intensified when metal detector tests of the crop circles uncovered three unusual metal plates. Each plate contained an image of the crop circle pictograph, exactly the same design that had been carved on the wheat fields. German historian Moschkotti Litfas helped analyze these metal plates, plates that were found to be made of precious metals, bronze, silver and gold. I went with the plates with another man together to Berlin. There is an examination institute, a very, very big institute, and they found 
there is only silver in the silver plate and the bronze is very unusual. We have never since seen metallic plates like this. If you look on this picture, you see there are a lot of circles, but there are only three circles surrounded by half circles. And that are the places they found the three plates. In all the other circles, they found nothing. How could such elaborate designs appear overnight in the darkness? Why did these huge symbols mirror the images of the metal plates? These are only two of the many questions that surround these mysterious circles. City. It's okay. March 7th. Well, partly it's taken to these very strange images that are behind your head right now. <laughs> these are pictures of equations. I've been, for the last 15 years, trying to answer the kinds of questions that my colleagues here have been raising. And what I've come to understand is that there are these incredible pictures that contain all the information of a set of equations that are related to string theory. And it's even more bizarre than that because when you then try to understand these pictures, you find out that buried in them are computer codes just like the type that you find in a browser when you go surf the web. You're saying <laughs> your attempt to understand the fundamental operations of nature leads you to a set of equations that are indistinguishable from the equations that drive search engines and browsers on yeah, our computers. That is correct. So the wait, wait, I'm still, wait. I have to just be silent for a minute here. <laughs> So you're saying as you dig deeper, you find computer code writ in the fabric of the cosmos. Into the equations that we want to use to describe the cosmos, yes. Computer code. Computer code, strings of bits of ones and zeros. It's not just sort of resembles computer code. You're saying it is computer code. It's not even just is computer code. It's a special kind of computer code that was invented by a scientist named Claude Shannon in the 1940s. That's what we find very, very deeply inside the equations that occur in string theory and in general in systems that we say are supersymmetric. Some of those codes are, are showing on the screen behind you right now. They don't look like codes, but these pictures, which we call adinkras, are graphical representations of sets of equations that are based on codes. That in the description of our universe, that is a supersymmetrical universe, which we were going to test in the LHC. If you believe that description, I can show you the presence of these codes. That's my statement. Do you have any predic um, predictions in your ideas or any ways to test any of your ideas any more than, say, the guy over on the screen? <laughs> the work that I'm doing is, in fact, so theoretical that we don't, we don't understand yet whether it is even possible to complete the program. We have found these strange graphs. We know that they are equivalent to equations, and we have found in these equations computer codes and so that's where we are right now. So I cannot give you a prediction. This work is less than two years old. But, you, but it's not that you never, you recognize that you will need a prediction in order to. As I, someone recently asked me, said, well, you don't care about experiments, do you? <laughs> and I said, no, that's exactly wrong. Because you see, I have spent my career as a researcher worrying about supersymmetry. I would want to see an experiment before I shuffle off this mortal coil so that I'd know that I did not waste my entire professional life. This is towards Dr. Gates. I'm curious about your theory. You say uh, there's computer code in these equations. Now, computer code is generally just uh, instructions for a processor. And I'm curious as to what the instructions you're finding are. And if you're not sure, what's to say that it's actually computer code? I mean, theoretically, the number pi has all the data that's ever existed. Well, we say that they're computer code. I mean, codes. the digits in pi. Yes. Yes. Okay. We say they're computer codes, first of all, because the structure of the equation is such that they dictate that there are certain things that are actually strings of ones and zeros. That's, now, that's just digital data. But it's not just random ones and zeros. 
as I er mentioned earlier, let me talk about something that you probably do every day, but I don't know if you're a computer scientist or not. Most of us sit at our... It sounds that kind of fluency. I okay, well, <laughs> most of us sit at our computer screens and we type on the keyboards, and we then send these, if we're using a browser, we're sending strings of ones and zeros elsewhere. But on the other hand, in the transmission process, there's always some fluctuations. So a zero that you type here because of static in line might be read as a one at the other end and vice versa. And so in fact, when you sit and type on the keyboard, your computer's doing something behind your back. Namely, it throws in a bunch of extra ones and zeros, so, which and these things are called error correcting codes, so that the computer at the other end can look at the whole collection of what you type plus what was sent and figure out if there were bits that were being flipped back and forth. And that's how you get accurate transmission of digital data. Among the codes that are used for this purpose are a special class of codes that are called block linear self-dual error correcting codes. They were first, in fact, the Shannon uh, extended checksum code is an example of one of these things. These are the codes that we find buried in the equations. Not just any code, but these self-dual error correcting block codes. It's quite remarkable for anyone that I've talked to. We have no idea what these things are doing there. Any literature out? I'm sorry? Do you have any literature out that... I can give you technical references that almost nobody in the world can understand. <laughs> <laughs> but, Jim, but I thought you had a popular level article I, on this? Thank you. Yes, actually, in, so this past June, the British journal Physics World asked me to write a popular level description of what we have found. So in the June edition of Physics World, and it's, a, it's published in London, the cover story is called Symbols of Power, it's about these weird symbols that have been showing behind us. We, we call these things adinkras. And so the, for a popular level description, yes, we've written that. But other than this one popular level description, it's all technical gobbledygook. Wonderful. And that's a technical term, by the way. Gobbledygook. <laughs> Thank you. There's a, a philosopher at Oxford, Nick Bostrom. Uh, the argument is called the simulation argument, and he argues that uh, we are all very likely not to, not living in a real universe, but living in a simulated universe, uh, and we are being simulated on the hard drives of computers of the future. Uh, now he gets there with a few simple steps. You uh, you simply have to acknowledge that consciousness is at bottom the result of information processing at the level of the brain and there's nothing magical about brains it could be information processing in a computer of, uh, of the future uh, most scientists think that think that's true they don't think there's anything magical about the wet stuff in our heads uh, and the consciousness is at some point uh, going to be instantiated in computers uh, then you simply have to grant that humans of the future will run simulations of the past in the way that we run simulations and the sims games and uh, and then there's just one short move that, that simulated universes by almost by definition will outnumber real universes and therefore we are a lot more likely to be among the simulated ancestors than the real ancestors now again this is this everyone acknowledges it seems a little crazy but there's but the assumptions that you have to but you take take on board are not not so weak.